we have, uh, once again, now we're transitioning back to Oklahoma here. We have uh, two great individuals up next uh, that's going to share uh, tag team uh, a little bit about their operation. Uh, we're excited to have Mark and Annette Thomas uh, talk about beef and grazing and marketing. Uh, most of cattlemen uh, in the United States uh, do one thing very well, and, that, and that's grow beef. And then they take what they are given at the sale barn. Uh, that's not the only way that you can do it. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited. I, I get to work with this couple quite a bit. And uh, well, most of the time it's exciting and everything's going right. And uh, yesterday, some days are diamonds, some days are not. Uh, we had a little glitch uh, with putting some Humix and, and some molasses on Tom and, and, uh, and some liquid 28. To, but we're going to get that work through and, and that just goes to show, you know, if you're willing to change and willing to put up with a few headaches, uh, man, if you can go from 60 pound in to 6.4, the same results, uh, that's, that's great. So I'm not going to rattle on much. I'm going to let Mark and Annette tell you a little bit about their operation. And I'm not going to get into a lot of the bios, um, with them. Uh, they, they can fill in that much better than I can. Uh, so I'm just going to turn it over to, to Mark and Annette Thomas. Go ahead, guys. Glad, glad, glad to have you with us. Hey, Jimmy. We're, uh, we're glad to be here. And, um, um, yeah, yeah we, we're, we're trying to recover from, uh, you know, all that excitement with the um, trying to get that um, application made. But, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're glad to have mentors and, uh, and friends like yourself to uh, – you know, say, hey, we'll, we'll work through this and uh, everything's going to be okay because uh, it's, it's been a learning process for us from, from the start. And so, you know, quite a roller coaster for, um, you know, the last um, 10 years for uh, mm -hmm. Annette and I. So, um, um, I, I, Annette, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, your, your background and um, kind of where you where you came from. And yeah, so I am not um, not originally from Oklahoma. I tell people I got here just as soon as I as soon as I could. Um, we moved to Oklahoma back in 2012. I actually grew up on a fifth generation um, uh, grass seed and sheep farm in Western Oregon. So very different climate, um, very Mediterranean, uh, very dry summers, wet, 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 cloudy winter. So think Seattle, and that's where I grew up. Um, my background actually is in animal science, so my master's is actually in ruminant nutrition or cattle nutrition with an emphasis in forages, and I spent about 10 years in the animal nutrition and animal health industry, and then about five years ago, full-time, um, went to transitioning um, to the sales and marketing as well as the production side of the farm. So not from this part of the country, but I think it's fairly safe to say um, that uh, once you start buying some land, getting some cows, starting a business, and having some kids that uh, will be here, we, we think we'll be here a good good long while. So appreciate the opportunity to, to share today with you. All right. Yeah, and so Jimmy, I grew up in, uh, I grew up in East Texas and um, um, lived there most of my life until um, I met Annette and we decided that uh, we were gonna make a new home for ourselves and, and uh, that's when we moved to Oklahoma. But uh, I, I got a bachelor's degree from uh, Louisiana Tech I've worked with uh, forages for uh, the last sales and marketing for the last 30 years. Uh, currently on the board of the American Forage Grassland Council and uh, serving as a president for the Southern Seed Association, which is a 14 state, yeah, 14 states, maybe 16 states um, here in the US. But uh, we're gonna share with you a little bit about our story because the uh, story is um, really what is your differentiator. And uh, we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our beef production and how we uh, graze cattle and raise cattle um, because our focus is on the end product and uh, producing uh, you know, a high quality uh, grass-fed beef product and uh, capturing a premium for that. And so that's what funds um, our development of the land and the soils. As it has the soils and the land, you know, uh, provide the nutrition and development of our beef. But uh, as we said, 2011 is when we got married. So we've been this year, we've been married 10 years. Um, 
in 2012, I thought it would be a really good idea to buy Annette some, uh, some bread heifers for her birthday. And um, she was really, uh, she was really excited about that. She, nobody had ever bought cattle for her. So anyway, it was kind of our way into the, into the business. Uh, the, the challenge was at the time, um, we were living in uh, Greenville, Texas, um, uh, you know, close to, uh, so we'd be close to Southwest Airlines because Annette was still traveling. She was working uh, uh, in a corporate job. I was traveling a lot, flying a lot. So we were back and forth the airport. But uh, we were looking to make some changes, you know, in our lifestyle, in our life, in our careers. But uh, so in 2013, we purchased a, our first farm here in uh, Major County, uh, Oklahoma. And it was a, a sand farm that had been conventionally farmed for, uh, by a tenant farmer for over 60 years, actually two generations. I think that the, the guy that was farming it, uh, his, his father farmed it before he did. And so it was, uh, it needed, uh, it needed some work. And, um, you know, I began to recognize that and thinking back on my, uh, my grandfather's experience in uh, his, you know, purchasing a worn out old cotton farm and, and turning it into a, a cattle and peach and watermelon farm in East Texas. But, um, you know, we, we, we built our herd we uh, started buying more bread heifers and every year we'd buy bread heifers and, you know, continue to increase, um, you know, our, our cattle numbers. But uh, in 2014, as uh, when we really started that, uh, started the no-till on that, on that particular farm and started uh, utilizing cover crops and started just experimenting with them, see where, uh, see where they would go. And um, they actually, um, the one thing I could grow was rye, and uh, the one reason for that was uh, I had uh, some pretty low pHs, uh, you know, just due to all the uh, the fact that it's sand and and the fact the way it had been farmed for 60 years. So we had to we had to just start developing the soils, but um, we we started that journey then and. You know, we had uh, we had cattle and uh, we had uh, we had the crops and we, we thought we had that piece figured out and cattle prices were good. And, you know, going in 2015, we started off the year. We're feeling pretty confident. You know, I mean, we're like, well, this thing is we've got this we've got this beat. And um, by the time we got to uh, 2016, we uh, we quickly realized that uh, conventional beef production was uh, with the highs and the lows, and that's what we wanted to do. Was 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 not gonna was not gonna pay, and uh, we would just have to keep working corporate jobs and and everything to pay for the farms, rather than you know the farms paying for themselves or the farms paying us. And that was a big difference because we were first generation here, uh, you know, and so we're having to go out and buy our farms and buy all the tools and equipment and everything else you need. And we want to do that without, um, you know, taking on a lot of excess debt. So that was another another big key for us, a big factor. So we looked at, uh, you know, how how we could we do things differently? Grass fed beef was one that uh, I was familiar with after you know being in the grass seed industry and forages for uh, all those years. And so uh, I I said, well, I'm going to go to a conference down and I went back to Texas to a conference at Texas A&M and um, learned a little bit more about grass-fed beef and what was, you know, as far as what they would say was involved. Um, it was kind of a textbook type uh, conference. I will say that once you start, you know, doing it yourself is when you really start, uh, start your education. The, uh, uh, that same year, uh, we had an opportunity, uh, we saw an opportunity that if we were to get uh, an AWA certification, which American, uh, um, animal welfare approved uh, certification that we could gain a beef contract for our grass fed beef. And so this seemed like a, uh, a you know, a good move for us. It's also, you know, in that time of um, that, uh, I think Annette was probably, uh, uh, well, what would you say as far as moving, leaving the corporate world? So I was, um, I was ready to transition um, to a different position. Um, and so the timing just kind of, um, either I could go to a new position in the corporate world or could decide that I was going to go full-time marketing our own beef. So that was when we, we made the decision that, um, I was going to spend my time sales and marketing our beef rather than sales and marketing 
um, for um, for uh, another corporation. So so we made that uh, so we made that decision in 2016, and uh, you know there were several motivators involved, but um, uh, it was actually 2017. Obviously, when you take a cow calf group and and uh, you're trying to go from stockers to finished cattle, you're going to skip a a year of um, you know having income. And so it was 2017 before we had uh, had anything to sell. And then um, uh, it, as it was growing and we saw the need to say, hey, we need to uh, get our own label. And that was when we went and we got our USDA federally inspected uh, label that would allow us to not only sell locally or uh, across the state of Oklahoma, but also across the country. So it's been uh, it's been a good journey. And um, and the, the key factors and pieces of that uh, come down to, for us, have been uh, get, gaining a certification. And the reason the certification was important was because one, it, uh, it would tell the consumer what we were doing with those cattle. I mean, if you if you got a contract to produce beef and, and uh, they say, hey, here's, here's the protocol, and uh, you, know, you go out there and do it and they pay you, that's that's awesome. If you got if you're selling direct to the consumers and they're and they're not people you know, if they're people you know and people you can explain and describe your production practices to, then that's great. But if not, uh, you know, certification allows that consumer uh, anywhere in the country to to learn more about how you're producing cattle with confidence. And so that's why we uh, chose to go with a, a, a certification or a verified uh, program. So basically, it's a birth to finish uh, production, and um, the, the the main thing about birth to finish, one of the main benefits to me is is that it's uh, it, it's low stress, and um, it's low stress on the on the cattle because you're controlling the process from the time the bulls are turned out. So you're selecting the genetics of um, you know what's going out on pasture, and then you're you're calving those animals out, and so you're 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 involved with uh, that process of you know, and how you manage those animals from, from preventing calf hood scours all the way through, uh, through the process. And so you're, 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 you're getting a healthier animal. And um, of course you can guarantee the, the diet uh, knowing that they weren't on any grain, they're completely 100% grass fed. You know, no confinement, no grain, no uh, steroid implants, subtherapeutic antibiotics, no ionophores. Uh, animals are never commingled, so they're never going to be commingled with other animals from other parts of the country that may carry, you know, other viruses or diseases. So it's a very natural, natural process of raising them, but it's it's one that uh, not many people do anymore. I mean, our our beef industry is broken up into segments, and um, you know the the way that we're able to do that is through um, you know, the miracles of modern medicine most of the time. So for us, it's really, um, it's beef, bugs, and biology. And I, I, I show you this picture here because uh, this was when I realized what I was doing was different and it was working, it was when I uh, drove up to the gate one day and I saw this manure pat and I could see where, and the cattle were just there, uh, the day before. So it was the first time that that manure pat was one day old and I could see that the uh, dung beetles were already starting to work on it. So the next day when I drove through the gate, I had to go back over there and take another look at that pat and it was almost completely gone. And so when I, when I began to see that and uh, I thought, wow, there is something to, uh, you know, this holistic system and uh, being, in, <clears throat> being in tune with nature. But uh, basically, the, the the way that the birth to finish process works is that we're calving on pasture. Uh, you know, starting in the month of March, we're calving on winter annual covers. So these these cattle are, are getting high quality forage. Uh, you know, from birth, and of course that uh, you know fills those cows up with milk. And uh, so you're really starting that that whole finishing process. You know, with the end in mind, starts from day one with no stress, out in the open area, healthy, moving them, you know, not, not having them sitting around in, in um, you know, areas where, you know, with a lot of manure and bacteria and, and things, keeping them on clean pasture with, with uh, frequent moves. From the um, 
calving pastures will move on to the the native native grass pastures and, and this these pictures here are kind of indicative of, of Mark and Annette so Annette's out uh she's she's got the post and the wire and she's walking getting her exercise and and uh, doing all the 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 work and then uh, when it comes time to take it up I come out there with the cordless drill and and spin those reels up but uh you know, today we have a side by side, which makes it a little bit easier, but uh, still kind of the differences between way Mark and that work together. But uh, when the cattle are out on uh, native grass, it's or the pairs are out there, and that's during our breeding season from uh, late May, uh, last week of May through uh, July, the month of July. And so we kind of got it down to 60, 60 day uh, breeding season. And, you know, grass, water, and shade. Uh, those are the main things that we want to make sure and we got, uh, you know, plenty of those in, for the cattle. So as the pairs um, are over on the, the native pastures, I have a finishing group that would be uh, onto other cover crop type uh, mixtures. This is actually an Italian ryegrass mixture that has uh, red clover and uh, brassicas. Now, there's not many brassicas pictured in this one. A lot of people have concerns about Italian ryegrass, but I do a spring planting and very little heading uh, due to the way I graze because I'm, I'm grazing it out. And this is actually right across the fence from uh, a certified triticale uh, production. So once the triticale is harvested and the, and the uh, cows are still over on, uh, cows and calves are still over on native grass, uh, then it's time to get, uh, you know, a summer annual cover crop planted right in behind that uh, triticale crop. Uh, this was another, uh, you know, day when the, when the light bulb kind of went on for me when I went out there and I, I took a soil thermometer, stuck it in the, stuck it in the ground. And um, I could see in the triticale stubble that um, on a hundred plus degree day that the uh, soil temperature was at 85. So this was in uh, early July. And... Um, <clears throat> Just across the fence in the neighbor's quarter, uh, which is full teal, uh, you know, they had harvested their wheat. And, you know, and of course, right after you get through harvesting wheat, you got to get in there and work that ground. And so that's what he did. And you can see by those thermometers, there's a 25 degree difference between those soil temperatures. So, what does that do to your soil biology? Well, we planted. A uh, diverse mixture. This mixture, I think, had um, up to upwards of 20 different uh, components in it, not all different species, because some of them were, you know, different cultivars, but as a, it was, um, it was a 20 component, uh, 20 species uh, cultivar mixture, but uh, it did, provided a, plenty of uh, grasses, forbs, and legumes, and that's really the key is to provide that type of diversity. So as the cattle, would, uh, cattle went in and grazed, we rotationally grazed through these uh, paddocks. And the first time uh, we went through them, um, you know, we were on once a week moves with, with, these, uh, with these cattle. And, and so we were able to move them across that, that piece. And I said, you know, I got to get more cattle in here. So I put all classes of cattle. I had cows, calves, uh, finishing cattle, everything in there. And it would still take about a, uh, it would still take about a week for them to, to get through a, a 20 acre uh, paddock. But um, you can see what was left behind. So we're producing beef, uh, rotating them through there and uh, regenerating the soils. So for winter annual covers, uh, this is the other part of, um, uh, you know, the other side of it when you're into winter annual, summer annual rotations. This mixture here has uh, triticale and, and uh, brassicas, uh, turnips, radishes, um, vetch in that uh, in that mixture. Uh, the picture the, on the, the left with the shovel in it was basically that was in October, November, uh, yeah, this year. And then um, the center photo was taken in, uh, I think that was <clears throat> early January. And so the benefit there with those, uh, those radishes were still alive and uh, you seem like they hang on pretty, pretty good well with the, with the snow cover. But uh, they would protrude up out of the snow, and uh, that would provide uh, feed. And, and that's when the cattle really started eating, uh, eating those radishes. But uh, as those would, would, 
would go away or, or freeze out, then uh, what would be left in the spring of the year would be um, you know, some triticale graze out that you see on the far right. This would be another uh, mixture that I do. This is, uh, I talked about using Italian ryegrass. I usually use Italian ryegrass as an overseeder onto uh, uh, some Bermuda grass paddocks. And, and I like to include the brassicas, red clover, uh, you know, in this mixture as well to get uh, grasses, forbs, and legumes. But uh, this is an excellent mixture for um, really, you know, when those cattle are coming off of that, uh, the triticale has kind of gotten mature and starting to head. Uh, this is a great place for those cattle to go during the month of uh, May and June. And then uh, in July, you, you know, it starts over again with uh, summer annual cover crops. So that's kind of a, a year in the, in the life of Mark and, and uh, producing cattle here at uh, Thomas Landing Cattle. So I think that uh, Annette's got some slides to talk about the actual marketing of the beef and how we take that information and of our farming practices and what we do and turn that into money. Excellent. So um, we'll do a just a quick transition here. Um, so Mark and I, um, obviously Mark's background is more of the forages and the soil health and mine is the animal health, um, as well as now I do the marketing. Um, and so we do play in each other's sandboxes, but um, <laughs> sometimes better than others, um, but uh, help each other out. But basically, as we say, you know, Mark makes the lead or is the lead on most of the decisions. Um, up to the point where he pulls the trailer up to the, the harvest facility and drops those cattle off. And from there, it's my job to make sure that uh, that beef, when it comes home, it leaves our freezers, it gets delivered to the customers and the checks cash into the bank. So um, anyway, so that's kind of the, the, the handoff or the transition. Um, and so we'll go into kind of some sales and marketing. Um, you know, I want to start off... Um, um, and talk about sales and marketing real quick. Um, you know, my first time that I, I started a marketing or a sales role, and gosh, I was thinking this afternoon as I was driving home from checking cows, I was thinking, gosh, between the two of us, we've both, you know, been in sales and marketing roles for almost 50 years. And I thought, my gosh, we're just getting old. But anyway, um, but, you know, through some of those things, one of the things I learned, um, you know, with a technical background that I have in nutrition and animal health, you know, I didn't want to be in a sales role. I thought sales, I don't want to be in a sales role. I was thinking, um, you know, that I just don't, I want to be in a technical and a service role. And so I think that's one of the first things that the mind shift that when you're going to market to a consumer to market your beef is to think about it um, from the standpoint of service. You know, some people will say, well, you're solving a, a problem for your customer. Yes. Um, uh, or you're providing them services um, rather than I have, you know, X number of beef um, that I need to sell this year, or I have this many pounds of ground beef that I have to sell this month, this price. So I think one of the first things um, to start to think about is some of this big picture, um, focusing on the why. Um, and these things are really important because, you know, some people skip over them, you know, strategy, mission, vision, those types of things. But those are really your core and your foundation, like Mark says, that are going to be your differentiator when you're going into the market. Um, going to strengths, goals, and your competitive advantage. You know, identify what you do well. There are some things that you have to do, um, but there are other things that, um, you know, areas you can focus. And I think that if you find the things that you do well and you enjoy doing, um, you're going to do more of them and you're going to be more successful long term. Long term. I think the most important thing, um, whether you're selling to a, um, you know, direct to a consumer or to resellers is how starting to, to format how you're going to or, or visualize and formulate that how you're going to tell your story. Um, you know, is it um, for us, you know, it's a farm family farm. It's a high quality grass fed beef product. I want to say it's a high quality beef product. I had someone yesterday who said this is the best beef I've ever had. Well, I want to say excellent and so excited because you have a whole beef in your freezer. So if you told me you had 400 pounds of beef you didn't like, um, you know, we would have a problem. But, um, you know, but product is, you know, it's where um, you're going to build on. Um, 
for us, that conservation, that regeneration of the soils, so that long-term approach, um, and then um, animal care. Animal care, animal welfare, I think in the industry, um, most cattle producers do a phenomenal job of caring for their animals. Um, and we really need to take the time to formulate that and to communicate that story to consumers um, because that is um, you know, what leads to long-term engagement with your customers. So um, working here, we sell, um, as Mark said, we sell quite a bit of our beef in Oklahoma. We do sell some um, outside of the state as well. Um, but what I'm finding across um, you know, years of direct interaction with customers, um, first and foremost, you have to have a high quality product um, and it has to be presented well. Remember that consumers are used to buying in a grocery store or in a butcher shop. And so, um, you know, the presentation of your product, not that it can't be butcher or wrapped, if that's how your processor does it, um, but it has to be when that customer, un, you know, opens that package and thaws that beef and cooks it, um, the product um, has to speak for itself or they will not come back. Um, they want it to be raised and harvested consistent with their beliefs. That harvested component, um, you know, I don't use the term slaughter, um, usually when I'm talking to consumers. Um, so, but that is really, really important. And so understanding, um, understanding how animals are harvested um, in, in a humane fashion is really important to be able to communicate that with, um, with producers. And as Mark shared with you, there are some things on that list of our certification. Um, they really like pasture raised. Um, so they don't like the idea of confined feeding animal, um, confined animal feeding operations. Um, not that those are good or bad. I'm saying this is what consumers are asking for. So if you decide that you're going to grain finish your beef, um, you know, one of the things that I would say is I've seen some people do it on pasture. Um, that are you know also supplementing with with grains um so it doesn't necessarily have to be all grass-fed but that pasture raised component um is really um critical it has to be convenient to purchase and receive i mean we live in a very um a very uh, instant gratification society consumers are buying online and even more so with covid the last year you know the delivery feature is really important too so how they're going to get it so you just need to figure some of those logistics out um, and we'll go into a little bit of that. Um, and then the fair price. And I didn't say the least expensive price. Um, you have to deliver value um, and it also has to be long-term sustainable for yourself as well as your customer. So as we were getting started, um, we we're thinking about product offerings. Um, it really comes down to um, the person who's gonna be doing your sales and marketing, as well as your distribution, um, how they want to spend their time. So if you are selling live cattle, so yearlings and feeders or breeding stock for us, um, this is what we did as we were getting our finished beef business started. So there are entities out there that are selling beef, whether it be grass fed or grain finished, um, and they don't own a mama cow. So what does that mean? They need to buy. Um, they need to buy yearlings or feeders from somewhere else. And so, as you're developing your brand, there's an opportunity there. Also, there's smaller farmers um, getting into um, getting into or getting started in um, specialty, um, you know, direct marketing, and they need, um, you know, they want good mama cows. And so that's um, important as well. And that's one of the uh, opportunities in that, that, that uh, we saw at, in that process. One of the benefits of having that certification was that uh, we were able to capture uh, more money, you mm -hmm. know, because they were certified grass fed. If somebody wanted to buy uh, some cattle and take them home and finish them, uh, you know, to market uh, grass fed, but they didn't want to do the whole birth to finish process. So. And some of those certifications, or a number of those certifications, are national. Some of them, ours are actually international. So I think they have European, um, you know, Canadian producers as well. So some of those certifications, when you're looking at those, look at you know how big of a pool um, you want to be um, marketing to, and then also, um, and we'll go into and focus mostly on the finished beef component um, and and how we're marketing that. 
So this is actually a photo that was taken one of our first harvests years ago. Um, you can see they are grass fed cattle. Um, if you've ever seen carcasses hang, um, you can see that the, the fat is a little bit more of a creamy yellow. Um, and obviously that's from the, the vitamin A precursor or the beta carotene um, from the forage finishing diet. Um, so those were 100% grass fed cattle, um, some of our hanging carcasses. Um, you can see they have a really nice, um, really nice fat cover. We still aim for upper two thirds choice um, on our beef and we age our beef as well. And if you don't have that fat cover, um, the beef isn't gonna age or, or your, your butcher should be telling you, you shouldn't be aging your beef. So, um, you know, we actually side by side um, put our, have seen our cattle on the rail and it, the primary difference you can see is the color of the fat, maybe not necessarily the amount of fat cover. So when we're talking about finished beef, um, the product you have and the distribution, um, first and foremost, you have to identify, again, how you wanna spend your time. Do you wanna sell halves, holes, and quarters? Or do you want to be one of the producers that's going in and selling bundles or packages? So that can be a 10 pound bundle, that can be a 50 pound bundle. Um, but basically the consumer is no longer buying the beef on the rail um, as a, a dressed carcass weight like they are holes, halves and quarters um, and, and or by the cut. So you're gonna see a lot of those out in the market even in Oklahoma where they're selling you know, beef by the pound you know, pound it. So a customer can order, you know, a pound, of, you know, a ribeye, two pounds of ground beef, a roast, you know, package of soup bones. Um, and so again, going back to when you're thinking about what you're going to offer to the market, what do you want to spend your time doing? I will tell you, um, obviously your margins are going to be higher um, when you do buy the cut, but you're going to work for that money as well. Um, <laughs> we just brought in beef this last weekend. So that's what I've been doing um, the last few days. Um, distribution. So there are some, you know, obviously direct to the consumer. I think that there's a, a huge opportunity there. We've seen a lot of, lot of, bit, lot of farmers get in over the last year, um, especially when there was no beef on the grocery store shelves. And so people are lo still looking to buy local. Um, you can also look at wholesale. So wholesale accounts, those are grocery stores or other resellers um, and restaurants. I will tell you- um, There are some national brands out there as well. That, I mean, depending on the size of, yeah. of you know, how, what kind of cattle, how many cattle you're gonna ship, you know? I mean, if you're that, that scale. Yep, and so, um, you know, and that's the wholesale um, component of it. A lot of times those wholesale, if you're selling live cattle like that or even dress cattle, um, to big national brands, like for example, a thousand, thousand Hills mm -hmm. out of the upper Midwest. Um, you know, they're looking for, for truckloads. They're looking for pot loads of finished cattle. Um, you know, there's a function. I think, um, we do have some resellers because we don't have an on-farm store. We live very rural. And so we're not located next to a metropolitan. So we have a couple local grocers where consumers can go and pick up a few pounds. And then those consumers that want to buy bigger bundles can go ahead and, and buy direct from us. So talking about the direct to consumer, um, again, how do you wanna spend your time um, and where are you located? You can do farm pickups. There's lots of farms that do um, on-farm pickups. Um, you can do deliveries. So you can do home deliveries. Um, you could also set up central locations in certain cities and have, whether it be every week, every other week, once a month, um, all your customers meet you there. And so um, that saves on your time and travel and makes it um, convenient for them um, and they get to save a little money. Another option um, that's becoming more and more popular is shipping. And so like Mark said, we have a, um, a USDA approved label. We work with the USDA um, processor and so we can ship over state lines. We also do some shipping in Oklahoma. There are those consumers that say, I'm not gonna be able to make your delivery point. I don't live close to you. I want your beef. How do I get it? And so we have worked with, um, we've worked with uh, UPS, FedEx as well. Um, you can get some reasonable rates. Um, you have to get kind of creative in um, coming up with your packaging, but there's um, companies out there like Uline that you can buy with, um, you know, your, your materials, as well as, you know, dry ice, ice packs, um, those types of things um, to ramp up if that's how you choose to do. I will say that 
even in the last 12 months, anyone who's tried to take even a beef for their own freezer to the processor, um, you know that your processor is the bottleneck and it will continue to be in the, in the industry. And so your selection of your processor is critical when you're thinking about marketing um, direct to the consumer. Um, and I would say that um, you may not wanna just have one it may be good to have two. Um, we've worked with our processor for a number of years, um, so we have a, a good working relationship with them. Um, but we do have a backup in the event that something um, long-term happens and we do need to, to, to make a switch. But um, you can produce the very, very best beef, have the very, very best marketing, pricing, distribution. But if your processor does not cut that beef and put it in a package in a way that um, meets the expectations of the consumer. You have just spent two plus years of your life um, on that animal and lost a whole lot of value at the very end. Go yeah, ahead. on the on the shipping thing, uh, one of the other ones that we uh, that we explored and and got a. Uh, I guess you have to get go through a vetting process, but Southwest Airlines is mm -hmm. actually a good uh, regional shipper where you can uh, ship, you know, next, you know, same day, which is way a lot of seafood and other things are shipped around, uh, you know, around the country is, uh, but you have, you got to deliver that to the airport and then the, somebody on the receiving end's got to, but if you had somebody across the country that, you know, saw what you're doing, liked your beef, liked your story, says, hey, I want to buy a quarter beef or a half beef, uh, you know, that's a lot, a uh, lot cheaper way to get it there than UPS than, than or FedEx, UPS, yeah. yeah. So on the pricing, um, we talked about it. Um, obviously, it needs to be fair. Um, it needs to be fair to the farmer, the customer. If it's not sustainable on both ends, um, you're, um, you know, you don't have a sustainable business. Um, keep in mind that your your customers, um, there are those that are going to price shop, um, but the ones that you want um, and the ones that you're going to have a long term relationship with, um, they understand that they're buying a different value product, but it's our jobs as uh, producers and the ones who are offering that beef to those consumers to share with them those things that we're doing different that are adding value um, and it's not a commodity product. Um, this, is, um, this is just our package um, or example of a package of um, our beef with our label on it. And so you'll see that you know immediately um, you know, we went to that extra step on that label. Um, I'm not saying you have to go with a full label like this. Everyone's going to have different needs. But for us, um, you know, again, when we're delivering value, we wanted our, our, our label to tell a story. And so that is, you know, part of the, part of the package that we're offering um, to, to customers. Um, the one thing on pricing I will tell you is it, it was eye-opening to me about four or five years ago. Um, know your, um, and that should be, uh, that shouldn't be consumption to consumer. That should be conception to consumer. <laughs> and, um, that means from when the bulls are out, um, all the way to when you deliver that product to the consumer, including your processing yields and shrink. And so, what I would encourage you to do is a first beef or two that you take to your processor, get a live weight on that beef, get a dress carcass weight on that beef. And when you unpack that beef, when you get home, you take out every single package, you count all your ribeyes and you add up every single pound of ribeyes, every single pound of certain roasts, every single pound of ground beef. And you multiply that by your resale price that you think you're going to go to market with. Um, and also include shrink. So you're going to have packages, some packages that are imperfect, um, that either you can't sell or you're going to need to sell at a discount. Include those things in there because I think one of the things that people think is, well, I'm going to sell at this price and this is what costs me to produce and even my marketing and my distribution. And why am I not making any money? Well, if you don't have a handle on what those yields are and what your shrink is, um, when you actually, of what you have to sell, unless of course you're just selling holes, halves and quarters, those you're, those you're selling on the hanging weight. So those are a little easier, but when you start getting packaged beef home, um, those yields can be really important and it will differ as well based on, you know, whether you do bone in, um, boneless, 
um, how long you hang that weight. And those are the things you have to consider as you're pricing that product to the consumer. Um, so we'll go into some of the, the tactics or some of the, the actual actions that we do. Um, I just did a, did a quick time check. Looks like we have about 10 minutes. So um, these are the things that as you look at this list, you don't have to do all of them um, to start with. Um, each of them has a different function and you'll find the balance that's working for you, I think, based on the consumers that you're trying to reach. So social media, I wasn't on social media until an 11 year old that my uh, do, uh, young girl that works, um, I guess she's a daughter of someone my husband works with and she has a cupcake business. She's like, you're not on Facebook. She's like, I'm on Facebook, my cupcake business. And I was like, I'm going home and I'm gonna figure that social media out. I still haven't quite got Instagram, but I do have Facebook. And so one of the things is that just, I mean, it helps with word of mouth and networking. And now, you know, last year when, you know, social distancing, people haven't socialized the same. Um, you know, that is, you know, you can tell your story. Um, the one thing I will say, so organic or paid reach, obviously, the Facebook um, or Instagram, I mean, they run their algorithms. And so sometimes you'll have all kinds of people see it and like it. And sometimes it just won't get shown to many people. And so, um, you know, you don't own your Facebook audience. So just remember that, that, you know, those can ebb and flow, but it does create momentum. It helps build your brand. Um, and also on social media, you can have paid reach. So you can pay for advertisements and such. I will say that Facebook and Instagram are a little bit different. Facebook seems to be an older crowd um, with maybe more content based. Instagram, lots more pictures, lots more graphics, maybe a younger um, crowd, but there's definitely, um, you know, so you don't have to do, do both. You can do both. I know a lot of people who do both. Um, they do Twitter as well. Um, but being out on one social media platform, I think at least will help. Um, ads. So going to um, old fashioned print ads, um, there are still some consumers out there that, that get those. Um, electronic, things like Google ads um, can be very effective uses um, and ways to spend your money. Um, you know, I'm a little old school um, in the local events, community events, you know, when we're just getting out there, you know, going to, we didn't do farmers markets, um, but going to different community events, um, events at other farms that maybe don't sell the same product. So you're not competing with them, but you just go out and talk to people. I mean, they have to know you're there if, if um, they're gonna buy from you. Um, we chose not to do farmer's markets. We don't have a big farmer's market here in Enid. Um, and so packing up all of my beef every Saturday for six months, um, I just couldn't go and commit that kind of time to one location. Um, however, there are the, those that um, in you know Edmond or Tulsa, um, who have been successful that way. Um, I will say that uh, the next piece, um, please don't go Google TLC grass-fed beef because you're not gonna find a website. I will say for anyone who's starting, um, I would highly encourage that you um, identify a website um, service and get a website. Even if it's just to put your name out there so people can say, I wanna learn about you know, I want to learn about XYZ beef, they can find that. Um, but more importantly, consumers are going to buy product online. So there's sales and order execution functions on the back end of those. So a couple, um, so something like Squarespace, I think is one that if you're not selling by the pound um, is, is one that I've seen used a number of times. If you're selling by the pound, there's a couple out there that I've kind of seen rise to the top. One of them is Barn to Door. Um, that's a little bit more from a marketing firm. The other one is Gray's Cart, and they come out of um, they come out of uh, Seven Sons is a, a family farm up in Indiana that has developed um, that has developed a, a website that can allows consumers to order by the pound and really has some nice um, backdoor functions as well or or back end functions. I guess is. Uh, where they, you know, print out the order sheet and you go and you pack your orders and they do the invoicing based on the actual cuts pulled. And so, um, you know, that website, think of it as a way to communicate with your customers, market, sell your product, as well as execute those orders, um, pack those orders and get them delivered. Um, and then the last thing 
is email. And we did start an email group recently. Um, and I will say that I was, again, kind of slow to do this. Um, I'm glad I did. This is something that you own. You own that email list. There's a number of services out there. Some of them are free. Some of them are very nominal amount a month, um, less than $10. Um, MailChimp is one. And as an example, um, and you can start to collect consumer um, emails, people who are interested or current customers as well. And that is how you build long-term engagement. And I will say that everything that you do for marketing, it's important to identify a few to start with and be very consistent. Consistency is the most important thing. So whether you're going to post on social media a couple times a week, you're going to go to a couple community events, you've always got your website up, and maybe you're going to do an email or two emails a month. Um, but that consistency, you can't just go, oh my gosh, my freezers are full. I've got to, you know, just rush the market and your customers haven't heard from you for six months. You're not going to, you're not going to consistently um, drive your sales. So final thoughts, um, start small, um, develop a, the, the best quality, the highest quality product you can um, and find yourself a good processor to work with so that that product is showing its best foot um, forward to the consumer. Um, identify your strategy. Um, so how do you want to go to market and where do you want to spend your time um, and consider multiple avenues for live and finished products. So that first year, you may have some additional animals um, that you don't, um, you don't sell as has cold holes, quarters, or purchase beef. And so how else can you sell those? Can you sell those to others who may need breeding stock or who may need finished beef for their own program? Um, again, like anything else, um, keep your focus on your long-term goals and measure your progress. So, um, you know, it's, especially now the way that processing is going and with COVID last year, there were so many ups and downs and they were big swings. And so, um, you know, just stay consistent with what you're doing and stay the course. Um, and just like this picture here, so hopefully, or I know there's a number of cow-calf folks on, uh, on the, the um, call here who, who can relate to this is you don't build a really strong mama cow herd in one year you're not going to build a really strong customer base in one year. So focus on attracting, getting your name out there, um, packaging your product correctly. So it makes it easy for the consumer to buy when they get it. They know what to do with it. They know how to thaw it. They know how to cook it. You follow up with them. So you earn that business and then retaining them. So keeping them engaged. Um, I don't know all the, all the um, technical or all the value that people put on a retained customer versus a new customer. Um, but I personally think that people spend a whole lot of time focusing on new customer, new customer, new customer. And if we just focus on who are those re repeat customers, those loyal customers, how can we give them a better experience and continue to pro provide them value? Um, we would build a stronger long-term business. Yeah. And the thing to keep in mind on the repeat customers are going to be your best salespeople because, mm -hmm. you know, those people that are buying from you on a monthly basis, you keep those happy, you keep them in, engaged. They're telling their friends and their family and other people about your product. And one thing I was going to say when Annette was talking about, she didn't have a website and I've asked her this several times. So why don't you have a website? And she says, Mark, I'm sold out every month. And so I literally just, you know, so it, it's, um, it's finding your system that works yeah. and, um, and we do have a, I've developed back um, for our order system. Um, I have a series of spreadsheets. So, um, you know, it wouldn't be something that Mark could, could step into, but it fits our scale and it fits our program um, and allows us to move the, the beef um, and deliver to those customers um, good value as well. Um, and it's also how they, how they've gotten comfortable with doing business with us. So um, not that they wouldn't switch over to ordering on a website, but yes, it, it meets our needs and maybe down the road, we will have a website, but uh, yeah, at this time, you know, that's kind of, kind of where we are. Um, and it, as we evolve, I'm sure that it will continue to change, but I can't stress enough. Mark asked me the question last night. He said, what percentage of your orders that I'm packing this month um, will go to repeat customers. And I said 80%. And so that is, that's big. And, and a lot of them, I mean, I have a number of them. I have extra cuts this month, you know, not a lot, but I have a few 
and I can just send them a message, send them an email, send them a text and say, I've got a couple of extra of these. And they'll be like, we'll take it, we'll take it. And there goes your inventory and there goes your shrink down and you can keep your prices low for your customers. So with that, um, if, like you said, Jimmy, it's a, it's a little different than doing live presentations. So being out of corporate world, I don't do a lot of these, but hopefully people are still with us. And if there are some questions, um, we'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, is there anybody still out there? So you've got 153 people still uh, oh. listening, uh, which is <laughs> awesome. And so Brett asked us, asked the question, what challenges have you seen and how have you addressed them with more people entering the direct market over the, this last year due to COVID? Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, you know what I'm going to, and I'll be very honest. Yeah, I'm going to be very honest. We're going to see, there's been a lot of producers get in because there was a need and, and I, I would love for them all to be in. There is going to be a correction that there are going to be those that um, probably drift back out. And I will say that, um, you know, those challenges, the challenge in um, the market is, um, or in, getting in is you underestimate the amount, unless you're selling on has, holds, and quarters, you underestimate the amount of time that it's going to take. Could you grab the beef from the freezer? I actually have a customer picking up beef right now. I, they're a little early, maybe not too early, but um, anyway, so Mark's going to go grab that. So one of the challenges is underestimating the amount of time that it's going to take to take 400 pounds of beef and putting them out to five, 10, 15 pound orders, getting that distribution. Um, the other thing that I think is really important is back to that processing. So currently I think processors are at least 12 months out. So not that there's not an opportunity to get in with processors, but you have to develop those relationships and, um, you know, and, and be someone they want to do business with. Show up and pick up your animals on time. Be easy to work with when it comes to writing processing instructions. Um, you know, like I said, when your beef is ready, they're not a storage facility. So move it out for them. Um, if things aren't cut exactly, yes, thank you. If things aren't cut exactly the way that they should be, um, be willing to work with your processor. But that's the, I think the biggest challenge um, that we're gonna see. Um, and you know, from a standpoint of your processors, um, and there's a lot of people in the market, um, but I don't, or a lot of producers in the market, but I don't think that there's not room for those people um, who have a, a story and want to be in for the long haul. Um, because like I told people last year, you know, our overnight success of having empty freezers every month was five or six years in the making. So, um, you know, that's the biggest challenge. Thank you, Mark, is to, um, is, you know, if you want to do it, there is place in the market. If you think that it's going to be easy money, you probably should, um, you know, you probably should sit back and continue to do what you're doing and not go into it. Cause that's, I think that's, that's one of the things is people kind of underestimated the amount of work. Um, and then maybe even they didn't get lined up with correct processors. They just went to any processor they could. And there were a lot of consumers that we heard from that said, Oh, I got beef that wasn't packaged the way I wanted it or whatever. And so that's a big challenge. Well, there's no easy money in ag and that if anybody tells anybody that uh, that's a falsehood um one of the things i want to want you to touch on and and uh, so i want to tell everybody out there i i asked annette mark to uh, as i was leaving usda i had uh, seven former uh, compadres across the country as fellow coordinators uh, and i asked them if they could ship them some beef for for christmas time period uh, a little late in the game. And so we weren't able to get it to them at Christmas due to uh, naturally them being sold out and harvesting and everything. But actually they ship uh, from Maine to California, to, to Washington state, to Louisiana, to Alabama and Ohio and uh, Iowa for me. 
uh, and just touch on that a little bit. How and everybody got their beef and was exactly uh, the way it was supposed to be, and was very excited. We've had lots of great comments, but just touch on that. How do you expand your market outside of Oklahoma? And if you ship, uh, is it that hard, or is it is it just figuring out the system? It's just figuring out the system. And the first thing um, that I'll say is having that website where a customer can go and um, identify, um, you know, find you online. So um, that comes to search engine optimization, right? So someone in, you know, Denver or Colorado who's searching for pasture raised or local or small batch or whatever beef grass fed can find you in Oklahoma. So the first thing is, you've got to have a way for customers to order. Um, like yourself, Jimmy, um, you know, our customers all come direct to us and we offer them a package. And so, um, but we aren't scaling our, um, our shipping business to be a, a central part of our business. But I will say that having a website is going to help you. The second thing you've got to um, is find UPS, FedEx, um, and sit down with an account representative and talk about some of the different tiers. You're obviously not going to start on the top tier, but you know, but you can get some discounts that you can then pass on to the customers. Um, we do dry ice on our shipping. Um, and so we found a pretty affordable dry ice um, supplier um, and we buy as we go. So obviously dry ice sublime. So you don't want to have a freezer full of it um, that you're losing every day if you're not shipping that week. Um, and then the packaging, um, Uline, it's Uline.com has a lot of different packaging and shipping options. Um, you know, whether you're talking the boxes and the, um, the liners, um, everything from styrofoam coolers, um, Polar Tech is another company online. So you wanna figure out your box scene. But for example, I started talking to my UPS rep and said, what are the dimensions? So for example, once you go over 18 inches with UPS, you go into a whole nother category for handling. And so you wanna know kind of the dimensions you need to stay in for the most efficient pricing. Identifying your, um, identifying your uh, different packaging um, materials. And then one thing that we do, Jimmy, is we only ship, now in, in Oklahoma, we will ship year round. We only ship October through uh, April, May. Um, and so we are only shipping in the cooler months because we ship most everything UPS ground. And so that allows us to keep our prices low um, for our customers. So there's different ways to do it. You can always do, you know, order at this level and get free shipping. Um, I think that our consumers are the ones we're marketing to. I want to tell them the price for their beef and I want to tell them the price for their shipping and I want to work with them to get they're shipping um, to be the most efficient. So we're shipping at a good time of year when it's cool. Um, we're shipping at a time where, um, you know, I don't ship the week of holidays or short weeks um, that we could lose product. And so we're trying to keep our shipping costs down. I think that's the, the main thing um, to focus on um, when it comes to shipping. And one thing that I do, Jimmy, um, and I didn't mention this necessarily, but um, I have consulted with different consum uh, customers. So people say, hey, I want to really dig into a topic for, you know, an hour call or whatever, we can, we can do that and go into some of the details of, you know, whether it be shipping or another con, uh, another um, topic. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, good story there. On Here's a uh, Sally's got one in the chat room. On the average, how much packaged meat do you get out of a thousand pound calf? Um, and, and I know you'll explain this. It, it, so yeah, so you said, um, and you broke up just a little bit. So how much packaged meat are you take, am I taking home on a thousand pound calf? Is that right? Yes. Okay, yep. So uh, live weight to dressed weight is 60%. Dressed weight or hanging carcass weight to packaged meat is another 55, 60% if you're counting um, if you're counting bones and organs. And so approximately 360 pounds. And that is an, a carcass that is hung for 21 days. So if you hang it for less, um, you're going to get a little bit more. Um, and it depends a little bit 
on if you're doing bone in and boneless cuts. Most of our cuts are boneless, but 360 on a thousand pound calf is um, a good number um, for, for what we're taking home. And, and doesn't that depend on your processor and also uh, your beef and how you finished them uh, as well? Yes. So grass-fed beef traditionally is actually around 57% dressed weight of live weight and grain finish can be up to 62. And so, um, you know, you can get down to say 55% where you go from live weight to, you know, to actually the carcass, you know, thousand pound cow or calf cross the steer across the scale. It's only, you know, 550 pounds on the rail. And if it's um, now you're, you're going to have less fat on it, right? So you're actually going to pick up a little bit of yield. You're not going to put as much fat in the bin. Um, but yes, it will vary quite a bit on your finish um, on those conversions. But a 60% from live weight to dressed weight, and then 60% from dressed weight to take home, including organs um, and bones and that, uh, like your soup bones and stock bones and stuff. Um, is a, a good starting point and it will depend on your processor and your aging process as well. One of the things that, that I've noticed about your marketing strategy is, is of course I follow you on Facebook and, and, and work with you on covers and nutrients and all that, but is your sharing of recipes and, and meals that's outside of per se the normal uh, menu that you might see that shows how to utilize uh, more of the product uh, of the animal in a, in a very good wholesome way. Uh, you want to elaborate on how, how you kind of do that? I think that's a really good way to relate to customers. Yeah, and it's going to depend what you share with customers, um, whether it be social media or your emails or your, um, your uh, website. It, it is going to be a little bit, um, you know, to, let's see, um, um, it, it's going to reflect who you are um, and for marketing needs to be authentic. So it's easy for me, right? So we cook nose to tail in our house, right? So <laughs> a few weeks ago, we had, or maybe a month ago, we had a beef liver cooking competition in our house between Mark and I, who could do the best recipe. You know what? I sell out beef liver anyway every month. Customers love that because I know that they like that, right? They appreciate that. But that's probably, I have that customer base that likes liver or that likes, you know, soup bones because that's who I am and authentically who I'm marketing to and just when I'm communicating to on a regular basis. Those are the people who I attract and I keep. Um, now, I know there's another farmer that um, may... Um, appeal or they're more of a high-end cooking, right? They have their Traegers and they do their smoking of the high-end cuts and their reverse sears and fancy things. And I have some customers that do that um, as well. But so their marketing, again, just being authentic to who you are will attract those customers and, um, and keep them consistently and consistently engaged. And that comes to that serving and that sharing rather than, oh, I've got, you know, 50, you know, or I've got 20 pounds of liver to sell this month, how I'm going to sell it, right? Um, and we are, um, and we'll see, you'll find that a lot of consumers nowadays um, are in the waste not want not, you know, they are into respecting the animal's life and using uh, as many of the products from that animal as they can. Yeah, Jimmy, we, 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 you know, through the time, uh, you know, it takes time to develop that diverse uh, customer base that, you know, wants all those different parts and pieces of, of the animal, you know, what some people would call opal, you know, as somebody else calls a delicacy. Mm -hmm. And so it's taken time to kind of develop those uh, customers. And I mean, because it was like, even like uh, bone uh, soup bones. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was like, you know, we had, we, we had a group of people that were just buying, just buy all the soup bones we'd sell, yeah. you know, to make bone broth with. And so it's, 
you know, when we came into this, I mean, we didn't under, we didn't fully understand all that. And I, I mean, Annette's learned, uh, you know, she got her PhD in meat Not science. Sure. <laughs> Not sure, but, but in, in meat animal science. science. Not, but, not, uh, no, I'm talking about you got your master's oh. degree in animal nutrition. You got your PhD in, in yeah. meat science. Yeah, because that's what you learn. That's what you learn. But, you know, another thing is a huge opportunity for producers is when you're selling is to identify those other cuts, um, you know, liver, heart, bones, tongue, oxtail. I had someone today order sweetbreads, um, cheek meat, all those things, because, um, you know, not that you're going to sell out of them and you don't want a freezer full of them taking up space, but those add to your bottom line. And when you look at, you know, price increases that you have to make every year, if you're selling a good amount of those products, that may have been going in the garbage, you know, in the trash at the pr processor, that's money that can go towards your bottom line. Um, and it also um, is a differentiator if you do it well. So if it's good liver or if it's good beef tongue, um, you can tell a consumer how to use it. Um, and you can also appeal to some of those consumers that can't afford, you know, a $10 a pound roast or whatever it is. So you, you have an option for, and you, and you share those people how they can eat nutritiously or nutritious, wholesome foods raised locally um, in a way that they feel good about. Um, but you know, they may not have the, the resources to buy the higher end cuts. So Mark, I'm gonna, gonna wrap it up with you on a question here. Uh, earlier today, we had the panel uh, talked about grazing 365. I know one of your challenges has been uh, how do I keep green in, in front of my my cow herd and, and beef herd here as I'm, I'm trying to market that. Uh, touch on, and I know you've done a great job in your presentation, but uh, touch a little bit on your thoughts about how, how do you keep that green in front of them and, and how are you going to do that at TLC? So yeah, Jimmy. I mean, it, it takes a, it takes planning, and then uh, and then it takes the ability to um, you know <laughs> to change because uh, your plans don't work out. But uh, you know, you, you put a forge chain together, uh, you know, with with that in mind is okay. So where are these cattle going to go next? You know, and I, I mean, as I'm moving cattle around one farm, or you know, I'm thinking about you know what's going on on the other farm. And, you know, are we prepared for those cattle to go to that next stage? Because, you know, one of the things like with, with our calving, uh, you know, with our calving, herd, you know, our calves, we wean our calves all at one time. So that group stays together as a group of stalkers and they will stay together for their entire life. You know, that, that same group, but, but they're moving from, um, you know, from farm to farm. Uh, my neighbors sit and watch that uh, me hook up to that gooseneck trailer and start running back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. They know it's time. It's time for me to move cattle, and so it, it's uh, that's that's the challenge. But it, it you know, and then it's utilizing you know a broad base of forages. I mean, you have to use every tool in the box sometimes, and that's whether you know your, your summer annual forages, summer perennials. Uh, you know, winter annuals. I wish I had more winter perennials uh, that would work here, but uh, but they just don't. But uh, you know, we do a pretty good job with uh, you know growing small grains and and uh, those type of winter annuals. And Jimmy, I want to make just a point to that. So um, when um, producers are identifying, you know, there are some that just finish cattle seasonally, right? So they finish them once or twice or three times a year. They hold to the processor. There are others that have beef in every month or every other month, there are benefits to both of those situations. But um, we are more of um, in the, we're always harvesting. We're harvesting 10 to 12 months a year. Um, and one of the things that going back to what Mark's saying is those animals, even looking at um, some of the uh, fetal programming that they have in cows now to produce the highest quality beef, those cat cattle, um, our goal is for those cattle to be gaining 1.5 pounds every day of their life. Now, maybe the week after weaning, they're not. Um, but, and so what that means is there are gonna be times we, we don't feed any grain, we don't feed any cubes. We go through a drought. Um, we sit down and say, what are our resources? Are we gonna have to supplement, for example, with some alfalfa hay to at least keep them at 1.25? If your cattle start going backwards or aren't gaining that, 
I'm going to tell you, or if you're shorting your cows when they're pregnant with those calves, there's research out there that shows that that will impact carcass quality, meat tenderness, um, ribeye area, those types of things that the consumers at the end of, you know, when you put that animal in a package or on a rail. And so that um, keeping good forage ahead of them, um, even when we get into drought situations or we get short, um, it's having a plan. Um, if you're on a, you know, if you do grain or, or other supplements, um, you can do that, but for 100% forage base, it's using, you know, we test our hay, we know those nutrient requirements, um, and we're feeding, you know, forages to keep that minimum until, you know, three or four weeks, we get some more forage, we get some rain, and we can move to that next step of our forage chain. Yeah, and Jimmy, and, and, and as I move from pasture to pasture, farm to farm, I mean, we're, we're rotating, we're moving those cattle. I mean, typically, I mean, it's, it's at least every week. And, and when, when the grass is growing uh, faster, you know, we're going to move them more often. Now, I don't do a lot of, uh, I have done, you know, daily moves, uh, but, but uh, I'm more of a, you know, twice a, twice a week, you know, two to three times a week uh, on my moves. But uh, moving those cattle uh, you know, is, is one way to, to, you know, one stockpile forage, uh, you know, to ensure you have some and then, you know, and, and keep those cattle. But, you know, it, it, the rotational part of it and how often you move, it kind of depends on, you know, what, what is your strategy there? Is it to get the most performance out of your cattle or is it to get the most utilization, uh, you know, out of your land? And so, uh, you know, I want those cattle to, uh, when that says pound and a half, pound and a half is a, uh, is a minimum. Yeah. I'm more on the, the two pounds per day from the day they're born to the day I get them there, because that gives me about on average, about 20 to 22 months uh, when that animal's from birth to finish. And in a good forage year, Jimmy, we will be, um, if we've had good forage years, we will be pulling off 1200 pound steers at 16 months of age. So you do the math on those. Those are two and a half pounds every day of their life. Those are good forage years. Um, so, and everything is gone by 24 months um, at 1,200 pounds or more. So, and we um, finish and we finish everything. Steers, heifers, and you know, and honestly, heifers are uh, in my book are easier to finish than steers. Steers get bigger and they they take a little bit longer. Whereas, you know, heifers are natu naturally uh, fleshier and, and uh, they have the hormones mm -hmm. that um, regularly implanted steers right would have um, and we're not implanting so those steers take longer to to finish so animals that wouldn't be good breeding stock or selected for breeding stock um, those heifers will finish very well so I think you answered the last uh, question in chat about how long it takes to build that grass finished beef and what average size do you normally harvest them uh, being weight and so I think you pretty well averaged that there that you kill them uh, or harvest them in about 24 months and 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 that that size so uh, so anyone else has some questions please please put them in the chat box uh, Annette Mark uh, if you don't mind if you see some more of them come in you can answer them through the chat box there we we really appreciate uh, both of you taking the time out uh, today to be with us and share your story about once again it can be done another way that there are uh, and it's all about teamwork and and y'all are kind of like ginger and i we separate the operation up where we both have uh different traits and different strongness and, and, and weaknesses so we try to delegate that out and, and most of the time we don't have to work really that close together all the time we're on another mission so uh, I really do appreciate everything that, that y'all done. And thanks a lot for a great presentation today. All right. Thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for the opportunity, Jimmy.